All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is supposed to be like a conversation, so feel free to stop and, and you know, uh, interject anytime. Um, for those who are listening to us through our Facebook uh, Live, you can ask the same questions, then we're going to be monitoring. Um, and today, although the topic is the history of, of Spiritism, um, it's as if, as if, as if <coughs> many um, important discoveries and events in human history, they don't, they don't occur suddenly from one day to the other. There's usually a process of preparation. Um, that was the same when Christ came. Uh, he was, uh, the, the grounds were prepared by Moses, um, who laid out the idea of a monotheism, of a single God. Christ himself prepared us with the ground of the advent of the consular. Uh, that is, Spiritism brings us uh, this message, his message, in a, a way that we can clearly understand and very rash rationally understand. So, but to talk about the history of Spiritism, I decided to divide this in two parts, and this is actually going to be the preparatory part. So, we're going to talk mostly today of the history of spiritualism, in which um, events and people will prepare the main <coughs> ground for the advent of Spiritism itself. And this is interesting because in the, in the codification, in the, in the religious book, Kardec, um, he, he has this um, specific, he has a specific uh, text of um, speaking, when he's speaking on, on uh, the different methods of um, systems that people have to explain events that were happening at that time, at the, the ancient tables. Um, he talks about uh, materialism and spiritualism. And he makes this, uh, this very interesting uh, uh, citation. And if one is trying to make somebody a spiritist, it is more important that first we try to, to, to make that person to be a spiritualist, right? And what is the reason for that? What is the difference between spiritism and spiritualism? So um, the whole thing goes around one question. Um, if you believe that, is there anything else in us that constitutes us besides our physical body and that survives the disaggregation of our physical body, right? So if you think that there's not, that there's only that life itself and whatever we are, our individualities, is the product only of material elements that constitute our body, then we have that the materialism, right? That's the belief that we are, our life is just a product of chemical reactions from our physical bodies. But if you believe that there is something else in us that is besides the physical aspect, then the next question that we have to ask is when we die, does that something retains its individuality. Because if not, it's almost the same as not, ha not having a soul or something else, right? Because if, if you don't retain whatever you are in acquiring this life, is that is almost as if you have disappeared after, after death also, right? That doctrine that, you know, whatever remains, soul, or however you want to call it, goes back to this whole and reintegrates and loses his individuality is uh, one form of the pantheism, right? But <clears throat> if you believe that there's something else in us other than our physical bodies that survives the disaggregation of this body and that retains its individuality after death, then we have what we call generally as spiritualism. So there is clear now that the differentiation between spiritualism and materialism is this retainment of our identity or whatever constitutes us that is apart from the physical matter. But the question is, what happens with this something after we go back to the, after the moment of death, right? And there is 
at the point where different philosophical doctrines have different belief systems and explanations to that phenomena. Some believe that this something was created by God, is called a spirit, and that it reincarnates many times as much as needed to progress, to achieve relative perfection, either on Earth, in this planet, or in other planets, and it has the ability to communicate with those who are here in the physical life um, during the incarnation. That philosophical doctrine is what we call spiritism, right? It's what we are studying here today. But there are others. Um, there are those who believe that the soul either goes to heaven or hell for all eternity. That's what Christianity believes in, right? Um, Islamism believes that the soul is, remains lit until the day of the final judgment. Uh, Judaism believes that the soul goes to heaven, goes to hell, or is either destroyed or go until the day of the final judgment. Uh, the Hinduism, Hinduism believes that calls that something Atma and believes also that we can come back and reincarnate in different bodies, including the bodies of animals, um, until it completes this cycle of renewal and rebirth and achieves liberation of the attachments to life. And there are many other different uh, philosophical doctrines. All of those are spiritualist doctrines. So spiritualism, in, in essence, a subsection of spiritualism, right? It's just, it's just a type of spiritualist doctrine. And therefore, it's interesting for us, while studying the history of spiritualism, to understand the history of the spiritual, spiritualist movement or thinking. So that's what we're going to go uh, today. We're going to talk about spiritualism throughout history, uh, the early, uh, modern advent of spiritualism, and we're going to talk about some manifestations that happened here in America, then the event that took place in Europe, that led to the beginning of the spiritual codification, and then uh, the spiritual uh, movement in the recent years. We're not going to cover everything today, so we're going to go up to the uh, spiritual codification. So and that will uh, be for another for another time, another day, another time. Okay. Uh, so we have been always in contact with the physical, with the spiritual plane, right? As long as we have been deposited here, our essence, our whatever constitutes us, in the beginning of the formation of this planet, and we began evolving together with the planet, there have, there have been a time that we gained consciousness. We, we were aware of ourselves, and with that we gained also responsibility on our actions. Um, as we uh, began understanding the world around us, we had intuitively this notion of the deity of and, and with that, the communication with uh, the invisible plane, let's say. So throughout the history uh, of all human ancient cultures, there are, at least the recorded ones, right, there are um, uh, pieces, uh, reports of communication with uh, the invisible plane. I, either the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Egyptians, um, the Greeks, this concept of, of gods, of entities who reign in elements of nature, um, and also of processes to uh, interact with the call of that, right? And among all those ancient, ancient cultures, I think the Egyptians were the ones who developed uh, most this knowledge of communicating with the invisible world. Um, but again, uh, this knowledge was very limited and because it was um, secluded to small groups, it was kind of a limited to a cult or an initiation in a, in a rite or a priesthood, it was not completely disseminated. Right? More recently, the grounds have been prepared uh, up to the point that uh, in this book, sorry, let me go back on here. Arthur Conan Doyle, in his book, The History of Spiritualism, he, he has this interesting phrase where he says, there has been no time in the recorded history of the world when we do not find traces of preternatural interference, right? Interference of, the, of, the, of something that is supernatural, let's say. Um, and more interestingly, he says, and also a tardy recognition of, from them, of them from humanity. People, although the phenomena was there, 
those at least at the time will not recognize it as such. So it took uh, some time to organize thought, uh, could widely spread, uh, see that uh, there is uh, invisible beings on the other side that we can communicate with them and we can act upon us in our, in our daily lives. So <clears throat> before we actually begin uh, talking about the modern spiritualist movement, mm -hmm. and it's usually considered that this modern spiritualist movement began at a certain date, on 30, 31st of March, uh, 1848. Um, there were a series of events, there's many, many uh, events that kind of laid down the ground for the masses to have this in, in spiritualist intuition. Um, and we're gonna just talk about some of them. Uh, and the first, the first person who um, uh, has, you know, recorded uh, events of describing um, a spiritualist nature and, let's say, body of knowledge was Emmanuel Swedenborg in 1744. He was, uh, first, first and foremost, a scientist. He was a military engineer, Swedish. Uh, he was an author authority on metallurgy, astronomy, physics, zoologist, he was an anatomist. There are five people with many things, right? He was a fi <coughs> financial, political economist, actually having anticipated some of the thoughts of Adam, the guy who did an economics, uh, Adam Smith, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, a profound biblical student who lived in, in the evangelical atmosphere of a Luther pastor. So he was very uh, uh, um, deeply involved with the Lutheran church. Why? But he had some. Um, beliefs that were a little bit different from traditionally the Catholic and Lutheran Church had as firm beliefs. He admits that every system or, or belief system, right, has its divine purpose and that virtue is not confined to Christianity. So he was open to say, you know, that you were damned if you were not a Christian or a Catholic or a Protestant. Every religion or had its merits, right? Which is very different for that uh, for that time. He agrees with the spiritualist teachings that seek the true meaning of Christ's lives in its power of example, and he rejects atonement and original sins, and he sees at the time the roots of all evil is selfishness. So most of his life he had his work as you know a scientist, a metallurgist. But around about 55 years old, he began having uh, development of his, let's say, psychic uh, nature. He had a type of um, uh, what they called at the time traveling clairvoyance, where the soul appears to leave the body, to acquire information at a distance, and to return with the news that is occurring somewhere else. What we today call uh, uncoupling or Folding mediumship, right? Um, there are several reports of this uh, event, and one of them, and he was in, able to witness a uh, fire that occurred in Stockholm, 300 miles away where, of where he was, and described the effect very accurately in the presence of other people who were in the Medina Pariah. But besides this type of mediumship, it appears he also had. Um, mediumship of physical effects. And in one of his first visions, he describes a kind of vapor streaming from the pores of my body. It was a most visible watery vapor and fell downwards to the ground upon the carpet. In which seems to be a very accurate description when we have phenomena of materialization of the extrusion of the ectoplasm from the, the body of the medium of physical effects. Um, this a statement is 100 years before um, the, the study that Kardec did of this physical phenomenon. Once again, preparing the ground, several mediums, this wasn't the first one, just one example of things that were happening brought by the spiritual world uh, to kind of introduce the concept before the actual manifestations began <laughs> spreading uh, worldwide. Any questions? So in these voyages, um, it's a little bit, uh, can you read from there? 
I'm going to read uh, for you. So in this voyage, you see, began having a clear picture of what the spiritual reality looked like. So he said that the other world, the world in which to which you go after death, consisted of a number of different spheres representing various shades of luminosity and happiness, each of us going to death for which our spiritual condition fitted us. Which is kind of a representation of the idea that there is not only heaven and hell, as was the belief for the Lutheran and Christian at the time. <coughs> and to the place that we were uh, was depending on our condition and our own evolutionary state here on earth. He also said we are judged by an automatic fashion, by some spiritual law, and the result being determined by the local total result of the way we lived our life here. Again, the uh, initial description of what we know then came to, to, to describe as the moral laws uh, for in spiritism, right? That, you know, this automatic judgment is not God who does it, it's our own conscience, right? So it's the same perce perception with other words. He also said that death was made easy by the presence of celestial beings who helped the newcomer to the other life, into his fresh ex existence. Such newcomers had an immediate, immediate period of complete rest. They regained consciousness after a few days of our time. We also recall, should have said on that, we currently see that after the passage to the spiritual side, the speech is usually in a state of confusion, and this stage of confusion is shorter or longer depending on the evolution of the spirit and how they, how material they lived, how materially they lived their life, or more spiritually they lived their life here on the physical plane. He also said there were both angels and devils, but they were not of another order than ourselves. So he was just using the words that are common at his time, but he said, they are us. He actually goes, goes forward and says, says, they were all human beings who lived on earth and who were either undeveloped souls, demons, or highly developed souls as angels. So he also says that this, these beings are not separate in creation. They are us who, after dying, after death and incarnated, Depending on our evolution, we are qualified or called as angels or demons, which is also totally in sync with what we know from the spiritual doctrine that we don't change a bit when we die. We don't become saints, we don't become demons, we live to carry on our lives and our beliefs. Which is actually the next concept that we have. He said we don't we do not change in any way at death. Man lost nothing by death, but was still a man in all respects. He took with him his acquired mode of thought, his beliefs, and his prejudices. And he also said there was no eternal punishment. Those who were in hell could work their way out if they had the impulse. These, uh, those in heavens were also no, not, not in permanent, in a permanent place, but they were struggling to get to higher spheres. Which also introduced the concept that we know, we know now of this evolution towards perfection and a different scale of spirits. Even those who were in what they call he 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 uh, heaven at the time were not sitting on a fluffy cloud playing hard. They were working and trying to get even better uh, or to perfect uh, more. Right? And those who were in what they call hell at the time had the chance and the opportunity to redeem themselves and to prove their work to get out of that situation. So a couple of uh, centuries later, we have Edward, we Edward Irving in 1830, and through three years, yeah. Did uh, the, the previous uh, character uh, mm -hmm. was he in Emmanuel Swedenborg? Did he write a book on this? Yes, he wrote several, and I mean he was a very intellectual, intellectual uh, man. So he wrote actually he he had uh, several books um, compiling his vision of what he understood is um, I think he actually uh, began a spiritual movement per se Compiling um, or kind of yeah his view of, of what in his strips what he understood of spirituality but yeah yeah he has works <coughs> so Edward Irving was born in Scotland um, and he was a pastor assistant missionary in St. John's Parish of Glasgow um, and by the 1830s and through three years in his life, wherever he go, 
um, there will be this phenomenon happening in the church in his sermons. It, it seemed like the spirit of the early Christians to talk in tongues uh, was coming back uh, in this parish. The phenomenon began in 1830 <coughs> with some of the people in the congregation talking in strange tongues um, and they just, just erupted talking and making noises which initially uh, were unintelligible uh, and then later uh, become clearer and clearer until our words in English began being understood initially just ejaculations and prayers but then in some people this faculty developed to the point that they were giving sermons and, and uh, long um, exhortations about law about uh, the law of, of the Catholic Church right um, in in discussing with people including with the earthen himself and sometimes he's agreeing with him and reproaching him and telling him no it's not this way he moved from Sco Scotland and went to, to um, Uh, to London also, um, and wherever he, he went, for three years this phenomenon was happening also. In London he became quite famous and there was a lot of large attendance in this church. So this kind of laid uh, the ground for other spiritualist phenomena that were happening in Europe, both in, both in the uh, Scottish, English, and uh, French uh, areas. From there we go, come here to the United States. Um, a couple of years later, in 1837, and for, uh, until 1844, there were very interesting phenomena occurring in a, in a group called the Shakers here. They had affiliations in one side with the Quakers, um, and with the other, with refugees from the Seguins, uh, who, who went initially to London, to England, to escape the persecution of Louis XIV. From there, they immigrated to America because also of religious persecution, and they established many colonies, the first one being New York. Um, they were, uh, they practiced celibates, a communal lifestyle, they were pacifists, and they had a model of, model of equality of the sexes that they tried to implement in their society in the early 1780s. So, in 1837, an uh, interesting settlement began happening. Um, it began with the usual noises, raps, and then it seemed that everyone, every man and woman, proved to be open to the spirits of communication. The spirits only came, however, uh, at times that didn't interfere with the user activity, and they would always ask for permission. And there's a description on the Arthur Do Conan Doyle's book um, in, which, in which he says, the main visitors were red Indian spirits who came collectively as a tribe. And then he, he quotes, one, of the, one or two elders might be in the room below, and there will be a knock in the door, and the Indians would ask whether they might come in or not. Permission being granted, a whole tribe of Indians uh, would stoop in the house, and in a few minutes they would hear the whoop here and whoop there all over the house. The whoops emanated, of course, from the vocal cords, cords of the shakers themselves. But while under the Indian control, they would talk Indian among themselves, dance Indian dances, and always show that they were really controlled by the red skin spirits. Describing a, a, a process, an Indianistic process, uh, very clearly. One could, could uh, ask, what is the intent? What is the purpose? There's a very interesting uh, uh, passage in the book where he says, Arthur Conador says, there are very few physical mediums in England and in America at that time who have not had a red Indian guide. We can only say for certain from our own experience that such spirits are powerful in producing physical phenomena. The physical phenomena, and then he, com he comments, the physical phenomena are still important, or very, very great importance in causing the attention of skeptics to the matter, and therefore the part assigned to them is, very, uh, is a very vital one. It was pretty much the same with the spiritual codification, but as we're gonna see in a, in a couple of, of, uh, of minutes, where many manifestations of physical phenomena have occurred to call attention to the phenomena, to pull the phenomena away. Um, one of the shakers um, 
was a study of events, and he described that this phase do, uh, could be divided into three, three big phases. One was the proving that the actual phenomena existed, the way the physical manifestations and explorations. The second was one of instruction, as even the humblest spirit can bring information of his own experience in after lives. The third phase was called the missionary phase, or the practical application, where the spirits were supposed to be taught. But then, what the Shakers found out later, it, they came to a conclusion that the spirits were there not to teach them, but to be teached. They were early, very undeveloped spirits there, spirits there in their early developments. And at that point, they began uh, catechizing, let's say, not catechizing, but uh, or proselytizing them in the way they would have done if they were actually met Indians in that place. And then one could ask, but why? Why couldn't the higher spirits do it by themselves? Why do they have to bring the Indians to manifest among the, the, this community? And the response that uh, Tuko Doyle got from a, a spirit was, these people are very much nearer to you than to us. You can reach them where we fail. And this is pretty much what happens in spiritual meetings today. The spirit spirits, they don't necessarily need us to, to you know, talk and to you know, give reason to spirits who are unaware of their condition and spiritual state. But it's much easier for us to do it because we are so much closer to them vibratorily that sometimes they don't even perceive the presence of the higher spirits. So uh, by bringing them to um, you know, connect with a medium, to feel the, our vibrations, our, our vitality, our vital fluid, it's much more productive for the spirits to hear the message and to, and to be helped than doing itself all over in the spiritual plane. And this phenomena continued for seven years. On the, at the end of that, they said that they were going to go now, but they will return soon. And when they return, they will enter every, or the whole world, and enter as pa the palace as well as the cottage. And only four years after that, the wrappings and noises began in Rochester. Um, any questions? So, um, Hydesville was a village outside of New York, close to Rochester, New York State. And the Fox family uh, had just moved there. The father, the mother, three kids, John and Fox, Margaret Fox, uh, two kids, Margaret and Kate, 11 and 14. The other daughter, Leah, was already living, she was older and was already living in Rochester. They rented this cottage on 11, 11 of December, 1847. Um, the previous tenants had complained that they were giving noises in the house. They didn't have many trouble until the next year, in March next year. And it is uh, because of, you know, it was a, uh, a lot of uh, discussion in the village. They called the neighbors and, you know, the, the law, the police, and they made written statements. So we have a lot of recorded history of what actually went on in this, in this event. And this is Margaret Fox, the mother, saying, on March 29, on the night of the first disturbance, we all got up, lighted a candle, and searched the entire house. The noises continued during the time and being heard near at the same place. Although not, not very loud, it produced a jar, a shake, at the bed, uh, bed steps and the chairs that could be felt when we were in bed. It was a tremulous motion, more than a frozen jar. We could feel the jar when standing on the floor, and it continued this way until we went to sleep around midnight. As the time passes, the intensity and the frequency of the events began getting uh, more and more tense. On the next day, she says, on March 3rd, she was just all night. The noises were heard in all parts of the house. My husband stationed himself outside of the door. She was inside of the door, and both could hear noise coming from the door with you know, one person in, in, in either side. They heard footsteps in the pantry and walking downstairs. They couldn't rest. And she concluded that the house must be haunted by some unhappy, restless spirits. 
I had often heard of such things, but have never witnessed anything of the kind that I could account for before. The next day, until this day, the noise were only heard by knights. Next day, they began rapping early in the day also, and they were very tense by the night. The kids were frightened, uh, but then you know how kids are. At the time uh, the, the night came, they were already giving the spit a nickname. They call it Mrs. Splitfoot. The, the, the spit they believe were producing the, the noises. And the, the, on, on March 31st, 1848, um, this called the New Spiritualist Movement had begun with a frightened child asking a question. He turned to the spirit and said, hey, Mr. Fiskut, Splitfoot, do as I do. And she began clapping her hands, like in a certain rhythm. And immediately the knockings would imitate what she was doing. The sound instantly followed with her with the same numbers of claps. When she stopped, the sound ceased for a short time. The other sister, Margaret, also said, now do just as I do, count, count one, two, three, and four, and she would clap her hands, one, two, three, four times. Strike one hand against the other, and the reps would come as before. And um, there's a, a nice passage in which he says, he was talking about the development of telegraph, right? And when these great things occur in humanity, the initial, the one who initially uses it is not usually, you know, very illuminated persons. When the telegraph came, the first message were the technicians putting the wires together, trying to make paths. And he makes this beautiful comparison saying, however humble the operator in each end, the spiritual telegraph was at last working. And with that was left to the patience and moral earnest of the human race to determine how high might he be used and to which uh, the, might be the use to which was put in the future. That is why this is considered um, the beginning of the spiritualist movement. At this point, there was the beginning of the modern spiritualist movement. Because at this point, there was a way of actually a communication of both ways by this, these steps. The mother, um, she's, she just established one tap for no and two for yes. And she began asking a bunch of questions. What if it was a spirit? He said yes. If he had died in despair, he said yes. And she began asking, and with that she kind of figured out the story, and actually Mr. Splitfoot was later found to be the spirit of the 31-year-old Charles B. Rosman, who stayed one night at that house five years before as a guest of the Bell family, the previous tenants. He was a peddler, a traveler, a salesman, and he had his merchandise with him, and $500, which was a, a, a lot of money at that time. He was murdered for the $500, and his body was buried in, in the basement. So he claimed his body was to be found buried in the cellar, uh, 10 feet deep. They began digging, but it was a rainy, rainy season, they had to stop. On summer of that year, they, they found blank, charcoal, quicklime, and human hair and bones, which were found to be part of a human body. However, they haven't found the whole skeleton. Uh, only many years later, when a kid was playing on the cellar, they have already moved, the family has already moved from the house, when the kid accidentally found on a wall the, re the remains of the, the skeleton of the peddler. Um, the complete skeleton and the peddler's tin box with his stuff inside. Um, it was hidden uh, in, in the wall. It's still actually an, ex an exhibition and a museum that, that you know, it's, it's there in, in that city. The Fox sisters, they began having um, uh, a career of sorts with this phenomenon of rapping, of answering questions. They didn't know what we know today in speech. They didn't know how to protect themselves against the, the influence of lesser evil spirits. They were charging for their, for their spiritual work. They had seances. They were made a lot of success, but they were also under a lot of pressure. The church had excommunicated them for being called the Church Devil. Um, they were called liars and threatened of bodily harm for um, in several occasions. Commissions of uh, physicians, examiners would go to her and try to figure out, try to prove that the phenomena was fake uh, many, many times, sometimes being very um, brutal in those examinations. Um, 
until the point that in 1888, one of the sisters who was going through some difficulties uh, received uh, an offer from one cardinal, I think, um, to say that all that sh she has produced were uh, fake, and she actually uh, reported that in the New York Herald uh, that the phenomenon was fraudulent. One year later, she regretted, uh, and she gathered a large crowd in a, in a auditorium in Rochester, and she not only recounted her statements, but also provoked a serial physical phenomenon at that occasion with everybody present. So that was happening here in the US, and at, at that time, the same type of, of phenomena might have been occurring also in Europe. But uh, there was one actual ship who took, in, in April 1853, uh, pamphlets of spiritualist magazines that were already being printed here in the US. Mediums were traveling to Europe uh, to organize the same types of meetings uh, in that continent. And they <coughs> arrived initially in England, but also um, the Fox Fisher themselves went and you know, stayed up here in, in Europe. Um, and that is where they traveled, they would begin having reports of other people having physical attacks mediumly. And we don't really know if it was the beginning of the onset of the mediumships, but they were always there, but people didn't have the courage to speak up. And this becoming a mainstream event as, as it actually became, um, mediums spoke up. So, uh, in a couple of months, it became a fever in Europe. In every reunion, they had what they call the table dancing or table turning. Um, the phenomenon spread to France and other uh, European uh, countries. Um, and the media were invited to provoke the phenomenon to do as an entertainment for people. The tables would rotate, would vibrate, would float, uh, sometimes would shake violently and tap one of the feet on the ground but they would respond to, respond to questions, they would answer questions from the audience. And uh, while everybody was seeing this just a, as a, a, a pastime, like a entertainment. entertainment phenomena, there was some who were looking at that and saying, hey, how can this table respond to a question? Is it the medium who's responding? What if the medium doesn't know the answer and the table responds to the question? Where is the answer coming from, right? This became so frequent, so uh, uh, prevalent in Europe that the newspapers at the time even, even had cartoons. This one, there's a, a young table and it says, it's like a CV, right? Young table of pleasant exterior, speaks several languages and knows a little bit of mathematics and many stories, seeks a position for finance manager. Um, the other one says, is, is a police and a woman saying, you said your cook robbed you, but where's the proof? Mr. Inspector, here is, here is the kitchen table which is ready to testify in writing. Because this was so, so common at the time, um, but people only took this as, as an um, amusement, right? But soon, there were people who began investigating the phenomenon seriously. Um, and by the investigation of this phenomenon, trying to figure out the causes and you know the relationship of the ones who produced things, that's when uh, we had the speech of codification. But I think we are now at time, and this is essential for part one. We will leave the actual talk of the codification for the next part. I would highly encourage, encourage you to, to read this book, History of Spiritualism, and also the Mises book, um, and make a comparison of the two, because it's very interesting to see the parallel of many, many accounts of people who had prepared the, gr the ground for the advent of spiritualism, for the phenomenon, that the physical effect phenomena, bringing attention to that the fact that there was something afterlife um, in order to make maybe easier for when the table, dancing tables came, the turning tables came, those who were prepared, those who were with that mission to codify this beautiful doctrine, uh, could see it, could perceive it, and could study it. All right, thank you so much.